Giving birth is the only time a woman comes close to understanding what it's like when a man has a common cold. Okay? Are you not ashamed of yourself? Are you not embarrassed? This is really embarrassing. Are you well? Are you okay? The answer is no, Monica. We are not well after episodes seven through nine. All we are seeing heated political debates, people getting caught lying and cheating, and moments with their families that are giving us a lot to talk about. Let's get into it. Hi guys, welcome back to Nikki Faces Reality. We are here to discuss Love is Blind, season seven, episode seven through nine. Boy, oh boy, we have officially hit the moment in the season where I have to stay away from social media because at every turn, it's a spoiler. At every turn, there's some tea being spilled about a cast member and it's just crazy. It's a lot of information coming at us, but in this video, I'm going to recap the episodes and give you my commentary throughout. If that's something that you're into, definitely hit subscribe because I review Love is Blind and 90 Day Fiance shows. Um, also, if you're here, give it a like, give it a comment, let me know your thoughts throughout. If you want to catch up on my previous recaps of this season, I'll make sure to link them in the description. And yeah, let's just jump straight into it. Let's start with episode seven. We are still in Cabo and they're showing us B-roll of everyone keeping it light and keeping it cute. And then they pan to Hannah and Zach. Wait, I said Zach, I meant Nick. Different white guy name, Nick. Hannah and Nick. And Nick is raving about their view, their lovely breakfast. And Hannah's like, so is there anything that you think that we should work on? The way she asks it is giving very motherly and he responds in a way that seems like it's been rehearsed. He's like, oh yeah, you know, I have to think before I say things. And she's like, yeah, and I need to have more patience with you because I can be a little bitchy. Really, Hannah, we haven't noticed. She's like, yeah, I just like snap at you sometimes. And it's funny because she's like, yeah, I snap at you sometimes. And you would think that they've been together for a long time, but they've only been together in person for like two, three days. It really hasn't been that long. Then they show us snapshots of everyone enjoying their last days um, in Mexico. And we get to see Ramses and Marissa on one. And she's really excited because they're on this boat. And as you guys remember, she was part of the Navy. This is something that obviously Ramses knew in the pods but for some reason he's on this date and it seems like he just wasn't aware of how deep um she was into it and marissa tells us that she was in charge of a division of sailors and so i would assume that that means that she was pretty high ranking as they're talking about it you can start to see that he is a bit pensive about her role in the military but regardless they're being super cute they're taking in the view she's like i'm engaged and she's posing with her ring and they just seem really cute they have a lot of chemistry Catch up with tim and alex and as you guys recall they had a big fight and he thought that he was gonna go home so we kind of see them in like separate rooms her hoping that he will stick it out she was really scared to see him pack his bags he's seated there and he's like i was ready to go but she seemed like receptive to the fact that I was really upset um, and I think that that's something that's still worth fighting for they really care about each other Tyler and Ashley are seen camel riding um, and you know he's like you ready to marry me girl and she's like yeah of course and they talk about wanting to start traditions um, particularly for the holidays he says that last year he was alone in Christmas and he's just looking forward to starting a family and she is all with it because as we know in the pods that's something that she really longs for and then nick are bungee jumping i simply could never nick looks like he was about to pass out holding on to that rope um we see garrett and taylor i think they're at like a glass um making place it's it looks really cool and then we get to steven and monica steven and monica they look like they're seated someplace maybe at a restaurant maybe at a cafe and she's like there's something that i want to talk about because it's been really bothering me and as you guys remember in that last episode she like shushed him because he was talking too much but then after she shushed him they just like sat in silence and she didn't say anything you guys remember that super uncomfortable well in this episode she's like you know in the pods you talked a lot about getting me flowers and i just haven't seen it happen and that's really important to me that like you stick to what you say totally I have had this conversation 
ad nauseum with people and I've learned that you only have to say something once and the right person will just do it because it makes you happy. I just will never beg a man again to get me flowers when I love flowers. So now I get myself flowers every week. But I get the importance of wanting to establish that with someone that you're supposedly going to marry, right? Totally get that. However, when she said this, I was like, you guys have been in Cabo. You've been together two, three days in this hotel. If I were him, I wouldn't get you flowers while we are in Cabo because you're not going to fly with them. So they're going to be in vain. I'd rather get them for you once we are in our apartment. I feel like those expectations should kick in then. Personally, you guys can let me know what you think in the comments. But she's telling him that and he's like, right, right. Well, I do, I do want to give gifts to you. But flowers, you know, I, I didn't mean like technically flowers. I meant figuratively. And this is where Steven loses me because I'm just like, it doesn't matter if you don't like flowers. If she likes flowers, you get her flowers. This man puts his foot in his mouth every time. Instead of just being like, yeah, babe, I totally understand. Like, I will step up for you. He's like, the concept of flowers, let's talk about them. And she's like, but I think what we do learn in this conversation is that he has a different relationship with gifts because of his upbringing. He didn't grow up well off. He says that he can't recall the last time he got a gift. He says this in response to the fact that Monica's like, you know, gifts are one of my love languages. Like, I, I really appreciate them. They make me feel loved. And I also give a lot in return. But what she says is like, listen, I'm not going to make our background be what keeps us apart. I just need to feel loved and this conversation takes a bit of a turn because obviously they're still learning each other but he is so off in her book he's like yeah you know like I know you're not expecting the nicest bag from a Kate Spade and she's like no I'm not expecting that bag at all because I don't want that at all <laughs> like she's like I'm talking YSL Louis Vuitton and he's like what's that you could tell that she's holding back, trying not to be judgmental, but she's like, don't you ever get me something like a Kate Spade when I want high fashion, when I want high end. And you could see that he's like, okay, well, I clearly got that wrong. But he promises he's going to step up. However, what he says is, you know, I don't really want to feel like I'm being forced into doing something. He's like, you know, marriage alone is already like a lot to take in. So like, I really... I just don't want to feel like I'm being forced. I'm not going to want to do it. And the way that he's talking, it's like he has doubts. And she calls it out. She was like, well, you said to me that you were so sure. That was one of the reasons why we selected each other. She's like, so you're having second thoughts. And he's like, no, no, I'm not. She's like, no, you are. What you're telling me is that you are unsure. And you could see that he's like a little bit scared every time she like is firm on something. Yeah, their communication skills are not great. You can't say that you communicate well only in the good times. You have to communicate well in moments like this that are uncomfortable. She's a straight shooter and he's a bit of a fluffer. He goes about it the roundabout way before he gets to the point and she's just like, are you in it or you're not? And I think he's a bit thrown off by the fact that she can be critical. You can see him in real time second guessing everything that he says before he says it, which only adds to her frustration. And I totally get it because he should have worked this out before they proposed. And so he's seated there, you guys, looking like he's about to cry. And I felt bad for him because I'm like, okay, like, I get it. This is overwhelming. But also, speak your mind. Like, this is the time. We see Alex and Tim on their date. Um, I'm shocked to see them on it because Alex said that initially she had this planned and he said he wasn't going to do it. Um, but after their whole argument, he went on it with her anyway. And they're riding across this, like, scary bridge. He's afraid of heights. Um, and after they make it, she's like, wow, like, I trust you with my life after this. You could tell, like, the adrenaline rush of it has them looking at each other differently. Um, and they're just like, yeah, like, we're gonna thug it out and we're gonna, we're just gonna see this through. So it's nice to see them on the other side of the argument. I just feel like old habits die hard and that play fighting-ish is not cute. And now, you guys, we have one last group hangout in Cabo. And so, of course, this is the time where everyone is, like, spilling their tea. 
The drinks are flowing. Hannah wastes zero time telling the girls crap about Nick. On the other hand, we see Alex talking to freaking Monica and Ashley and being like, can you believe that he was about to leave? If he left, I don't have this man's phone number. Like, so it's just hilarious how quick the girls are like, girl, let me tell you what I've been going through with this man. And then all of a sudden, there are fireworks. And so everyone runs outside to see them. Monica sees Steven at the bar and she's like, babe, come. And he's like, yeah, just one moment. Because he's talking to Garrett at the bar. They go out. Some couples are coupled up. Some of the girlies are together. Some of the guys together. But Monica, you can see, keeps looking back to see if Steven's going to show up. He does not. So when they go back in, Monica makes it a point to go to Steven and say, wow, the fireworks, so romantic, right, babe? Oh, you're just so sweet, so attentive, making it super awkward. And like loud enough for everyone to hear. This man is shaking in his boots and she knows it and she knows it and she's just like with power about it. <laughs> so he goes to her. He's like, hey, babe, do you need a drink? Are you OK? And she's like, no, I'm fine. I'm talking with the girls. I'm fine. And he and again, he's like trying to suss out like if they're going to have a long night fighting or if they're going to be OK. So he just decides to park himself next to her. I don't know what it is, you guys. The girls in this season, they are pretty but vicious. They are very mean. And I'm not saying that women owe men kindness, but there's just like a level of like pissiness, a level of bite that I just, mm, I think it's a little problematic. And Monica gives that because she's telling the girls before he parks himself, she's like, yeah, he's so scared of me. I don't know, like it would be problematic for me if a man said this. And that's why it feels icky when she said it. But anyway, Stephen does himself no favors. He sits next to her. And then I don't know what leads to this, but he just starts yapping to Monica and Taylor about, you know, being on the show. It's kind of like breaking the fourth wall a little bit. He's talking about like, oh, the people that are going to come out, pretending that they know them. But then it takes a turn where he starts talking about the temptation that's going to come up. All of a sudden, there's going to be an influx of girls getting into their DMs, wanting to do special jobs to them. And you could see Monica being like, how did we get here? Like, and the way that he talks about it is just such like a crass vulgar way and Taylor's also looking at Monica like um we were talking and this guy just sat here and started talking about this and when Stephen starts talking he doesn't stop so Monica just excuses herself away because she's annoyed but then poor Taylor is stuck with him while he's just rambling off that's the last thing that we see at the party we see everybody go to their rooms start their nighttime routines we see a quick little moment with Garrett um and Taylor and she thanks him for taking things at her pace taking it slow really taking the time to get to know each other so it's safe to assume that they have not been intimate, but he doesn't seem like peeved or annoyed by it. He's like, actually, yeah, I I'm into this. And so the next time that we see all of them is back in DC. Of course, the Lachey's step in and they're like, this is the part of the experiment where everyone lives together, they get their phones back, they get to integrate their lives with their friends and family. Will they determine that love is blind? And every time I see this part with everyone going through their phones, I'm always like, can you imagine being on the receiving end of that call? Like your friend or your sister is like, yeah, I'm getting married in two weeks. Want to be my maid of honor? Even though you have no idea if this man is a serial killer, serial cheater, broke, nothing. Hannah and Nick are at the house and she's just asking him different questions about, you know, what their day-to-day -day will be like. Will he take out the trash? Will he look after her dog? And she kind of implies that he seems like the guy that will only take out the trash if she sends him, which is a wild prediction to make when you haven't actually lived together. Anna just throws me off because for such a deeply insecure person, she navigates the world with this like rotten attitude. And it's sad because... You should want to instill confidence in the people that you love. And I feel like she talks down. She's saying all these things, but she's like, yeah, because I'm definitely more mature than you. And it's like, 
Is maturity in the room with us? Like, honestly, the jokes write themselves. She's a joke. But the next scene we see is Monica and Steven. Another joke. Um, they're looking around their house and he's like, wow, yeah, we can definitely host people. And she's like, absolutely, babe. We can definitely host people. And, you know, we have to get groceries. And you know what else? Flowers. Because remember, I told you that I want flowers. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, definitely. And groceries. And she's like, and what else? Flowers. And it's just super uncomfortable because Steven also gives me the vibe of a Tim that will do things out of spite. So the more you tell him to do something, he won't do it. You see Taylor and Garrett in their apartment and she's like, okay, moment of truth. I get to see your Instagram. And that's hilarious, but also accurate. But that would be one of the things that you'd want to see right away and Garrett tells us that his Instagram is mostly fish him with fish and I'm like wow to think that we judge guys with fish pictures on socials a lot particularly dating apps but we could be missing out on a Garrett because so far Garrett seems like a stand-up guy so let this be a lesson to all of us, okay? In his defense, what he says is, listen, I work a lot and I haven't been dating, so all of my free time is fishing. Obviously, there's more to his personality than just fish. And now when I think about like my social media, I don't think it fully like grasps who I am as a person because most of my Instagram, you would think that I'm the most vain person. It's just like outfit pictures. But I don't think it'll show you that I like concerts. It won't show you my family much. It won't show you all of the things that I do with my friends. So maybe we shouldn't judge social media so much. It's just overall really cute to see everyone like trying to settle into their apartment. We see Alex and Tim and like she wants to cuddle all night and he's like, mm, I run hot. Like and she's like, wow, I'm the man that I have to force to cuddle. But then they pan to Ashley and Tyler and she's like, oh, I love that we like to sleep in the same temperature. So I really like that they're like highlighting the little things that you don't really know until you live with someone. Marissa and Ramsey's are in their apartment and they're talking about wedding planning. And he's like, you know, I'm not going to be a groomzilla, but I definitely have opinions because apparently Marissa wants an all black wedding. And he's like, that's depressing. This is where episode seven gets real because it's time to meet the families. So we see Garrett and Taylor go to meet his family. They have a massive house. It is beautiful. Um, when they arrive, you know, she brings gifts. They exchange pleasantries. But the vibe is a little, like, grim. There's all these people, like, surrounding them. And the mom is, like, looking at them very intently. And the sister immediately is like, yeah, so I heard that your parents don't want to really be involved with this. And I'm like, ooh. Did Garrett give you that information? Did a producer like push you to ask that? The way that it came was like, Ooh. and Taylor's like, they support us. It's not that, you know, they're against this. My dad just doesn't feel comfortable with people in our house, cameras in our house, which is totally understandable. But she does say that they are working it out to get them to fly down there to make it happen. The whole time Taylor's talking, Garrett's mom is just like looking at them really like, I don't know. It's just like with this look of doubt, like she's just not sold on this process, which I can't blame her. It's crazy to hear that probably like your baby boy is getting married to someone that you don't really know. And it's in such a short time. I understand that your mama bear instincts would be like, okay, this is a lot. I'm trying to be supportive, but this is scary. I get all of that. Eric did his best to like bear his heart to his family. You know, like, they went through a lengthy process. He's waited a long time to find a love like this. You guys, then the mom just breaks down. And Taylor really, like, held herself together during this. But the mom is like, you know, I don't want him to get hurt. And I also don't want you to get hurt. And this is all very crazy. And these moments, as uncomfortable as they are, I think are really important because they remind us again that these are real people and that their actions affect their loved ones as well. And like, you obviously would want to be joining this family. And while their opinions aren't make or break, they are important. And Taylor 
you know, she takes this all in and someone else could have probably been offended, but she's dealing with some pushback from her own family and they both bonded on the fact that their families are the center of their world. So she really took her time to give her a very respectful response, but also like acknowledged their feelings and reiterated that, you know, they're going to make the best decision for them and for their community but she just wants them to trust that they're going to do what's right and that they really love each other and they want to see it through until they can't. And I really love her speech because she didn't necessarily like go out of her way to prove herself. She just made her intentions clear. And Garrett in this moment was very noticeably quiet. And I don't know if it was edited out or he really didn't say anything. And I know that someone else would want him to like vouch for her more. And I can see why people would be like, mm, he should have spoke up more. He should have defended her to his family because again, like they were all surrounding them and it was a lot. But I think that he also knew that Taylor could hold her own. And I would like to believe that if she really needed the backup, that he would have. But that's the end for now. Then the next scene that we see is Ramsey's and he's cooking it up. Marissa's on her way from law school. Um, and his phone keeps dinging in the scene and we don't really know what's happening. But then she walks in and we hear that she was sending him spicy photos. So they get to talking again about the wedding and he, it does come up that he's like, my mom would be pissed if it didn't have some sort of like Christian element. He's referring to the ceremony. So what Marissa says is that, you know, she struggles with religion because she grew up Mormon and she just feels like her religion and her service um, in the Navy, everything was so male-centered and she just doesn't want that to be the center of her marriage. Ramses agrees, but for different reasons because as we know, he grew up super religious, he was actually part of the ministry and he just, he, he gets it. Had to separate himself from that to evolve into the person that he is and he just wants, you know, this wedding to also be about their family, which she's in agreement of. Um, so he's like, you know, maybe if we pray before the ceremony, I think my mom will be fine. But when she compares religion and the military, she does say, you know, it's crazy to even think that because I used to be so patriotic. And as she says this, Ramses is like, oh, yeah, you were. Mm. And she's like, yeah, like, I, you know, I can never talk ill about the military because it did so much for me he's like yeah how interesting is it that it did so much for you and people that join but is the demise of so many other countries she's like you know i don't always agree with everything that happens in the military but i support them i support our troops and he's like mm. and he's being a bit passive aggressive because it's obvious that he feels a way but he's not being forthcoming with it and she's doing the thing where she like overcompensates like with a smile because she's uncomfortable and it's and there's like this underlying like mm, like are we gonna talk about this right now I, I guess we should talk about it i have my own feelings with our military um I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter. Like, war really makes me nauseous. I understand that countries have the right to set themselves up for protection, especially America. I feel like we dip our feet everywhere. I feel like it's only a matter of time before, like, something happens on our turf. I am dreading the thought of it. But war is something that given the powers that be, seem to be inevitable. No one has conflict resolution anymore, right? That being said, I do believe that the people that risk their lives should be compensated. I think that they should be protected. I think that a lot of veterans are suffering. Um, a lot of them have lifelong injuries and they're just not being taken care of. Like there's no reason why a vet should be homeless. Things like that. What I struggle with of course, the terrorizing of nations, of innocent people, it just does not sit well with me. So, so there's that, the taking of innocent lives that ugh, keeps me up at night. But then the biggest qualm that I have with just all military is just, just feel like a lot of the practices can look predatory. Like, 
when you see these recruiters posted up in the hood promising money, success, and all these things to these impressionable young people, the selling of the dream of it is what makes me uncomfortable. But I also recognize that there are people that love this and have thought about it thoroughly and joined. People that come from generations of people that have served. That's different. And you and I may not agree on this and it's perfectly fine. But, you know, our existence in itself is political and people are going to have feelings. And these two, like, they look like very much alike, but they have completely different upbringings. And conversations like this are important to have definitely before you get married, but especially before you have children. And so what Ramsey says is that he loves America and that is why he critiques it. And she's like, listen, like I totally get that some of the things that happen are gruesome and I don't align with that, but I still support it. Like she says that she grew up on a base ever since she was two years old. Um, so this is all she knows. She says it's like, listen, this is a job for many people. And he's like, mm, a job that causes harm. Like, I can't stomach the thought of being okay with myself and doing a job like that. And what he says is, you make it sound like these people were forced into these positions. They made the choice to serve. You are making the choice to represent this, this entity that goes and causes harm to others. And you could see that Marissa is like wrestling with her own feelings about, you know, her history. But also, while I think that this conversation is important, Ramses, you knew that she served before you picked her. Like, you obviously was important to her. She did it for eight years or something like that. And so while it's a conversation that should be had, I think that it should have been had in the pods. Because he's making it clear that, like, it's important that him and his partner align in this because he just doesn't support it. And I think his experience is that he came from Venezuela and, you know, the U.S. is very involved with Venezuela and, like, he has different feelings from it. He has skin in the game in a different way. So, again, if he felt so strongly about that, this is something that should have been covered before because she made no secret that she was in the military. She's feeling really judged and he's like, no, I'm not judging you. Like we're talking. But she's like, I mean, I was really in it two years ago. So are you saying that you wouldn't have dated me two years ago? And he's like, no, I wouldn't have. Probably not. And so she's feeling pretty vulnerable because this was, you know, a deep talk to have. And she's like, listen, I'm really proud of the work that I did. And I understand you not agreeing with the military, but I can't be with you. I can't have you being ashamed of my work in the military, my part. He's like, I'm not going to do it, but would that mean that like if I'm involved again, like you wouldn't want to be with me? And he's like, no, I will not be with you if you're active. And it's just like a bombed out environment from here on out. And now episode eight. In episode eight, it starts with Ashley and Tyler still being cute in their apartment. She's like, you don't want to have too many opinions on our wedding, right? And he's like, I like to have some thoughts. Well, I have some ideas. And she's like, I'll consider your opinions. So that's a no on Tyler, okay? Um, the next thing that we see is Monica and Steven. And he's taken her to like this like flower shop. I'm pretty sure the producer set this up to save him. But they're basically at this place where they can make their own like flower pressings. Um, and so I'm guessing Monica wants to do this with her bouquet from the wedding. I just want to know that Stephen is like, yeah, you know, she's been getting on me about this. So here she'll get flowers that will last forever. Like, oh, so you think that this will excuse you from getting her flowers every week. It's almost like Steven doesn't understand women or like he's going out of his way to purposely not understand Monica's requests because this isn't going to fly. But this is nice for today. So the next scene that we see is of Nick bringing Hannah to his home. Um, and first of all, all of these people have money because this house is huge. It's lovely. You know that Nick lives at home and he says that, you know, he was always out of town with his profession. So it didn't make sense to get a place of his own. But also looking at this house, it's massive. 
If my parents and I get along and they have all this space, I'm holding on to my room. I don't care. Sure, he's 28, but like, if I didn't have to pay rent, I wouldn't. So like, I get it. They walk into the house and, you know, it's walls of family photos. And I'm not sure if we discussed what his background is. I want to assume Italian, but not sure. Because there's like all of these like Christian relics. Um, but Hannah says that she's not religious. Um, and is it okay that I'm not religious? Like, are they still going to like me? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, totally. They just care that you have good values. And so this is his childhood home. So he shows her his old room. Um, and then they go down to the basement, which is where he lives currently. And, you know, and Hannah's doing her thing where she's like poking fun. Like, are you sure you cleaned your room? Are you sure your mom didn't clean it before we came here? She's like snooping around and she opens this door and she sees the um, pool table that he has. And he had told her that he had a pool table. But in her imagination, she like visualized this like Big pool table I'm guessing like something fancier I think this is a really nice place but she's talking about it like he hyped it up and she's not impressed and that's been the whole thing with them from the start which makes me give her a side eye because when she was talking with Rich Leo she was like no money is not a problem and Nick has been pretty humble and has expressed that he's not where he wants to be but this is a nice ass house and she's just like mm, i thought it was gonna be bigger you guys may think that i'm coming down on hannah too hard i just think that her personality is like a repellent in itself like but even when she like throws her like gross looks at him or like says her sly comments he's just like trying to push through and he's like, yeah, wow, like, I mean, yeah, I guess you have to see everything and we're going to move in pretty fast. And she's like, I'm not moving in here with your parents. That's not happening. But I'm also like, where is she living? Because she doesn't have a job. So I would imagine she's living with her parents is the assumption that he's going to move in with her there. Anyway, the next scene that we see is Ramsey's and Marissa and they're meeting up with her friends at like this lounge. And they immediately jump straight into the fact that he has feelings about her military past. And all of her friends have been involved in one way or another with the military. So they're like, hmm, okay. And again, he reiterates that he feels like politics are connected to your ethics. So war is not something that he can really stomach. And so this is the conversation where he brings up his background from Venezuela and just like how deeply affected he is by all of it. And he brings up war, he brings up Palestine. And I was really shocked to see it on Netflix because obviously it's a very real thing that's been occurring for decades, but is extremely like in our face um, right now because of everything that's been going on since October specifically. So I think it's brave of him to speak on it because this is reality TV and in real life, this is at the forefront of our news. I just was shocked that it was televised, that's all. And I love that they were able to talk about it and not villainize him or her. It was just a matter of these are our different views, but we love each other. And we just gotta iron these things out before we plan a future. Next scene, you guys, is with Alex and Tim. And I think this was the first moment that I sort of liked them. I think I mainly changed my opinion on Tim from here on out. Um, because initially I was like, oh my god, like, he doesn't ask her questions about herself. He's trauma dumping. Is he... Is he going to morph into his sister? Does he, does he want her to morph into his sister? It was just a lot. And the way that they communicate is still not my favorite. I think that play fighting is a slippery slope. And we saw where it took them. But one thing that they bonded over is family. But she, she always said to the president that her dad is the main guy in her life. And that is who Tim needs to aim to impress. When he proposed, he read her a letter that's intended for her father. So, like, everything has been leading to this moment. They are in their apartment, um, and he's, like, grilling it up, okay? And she's, like, prepping him. And she's like, okay, so everyone knows about the experiment except my dad. So this is how you should have the conversation. And I had mixed feelings about this because I understand wanting Tim to, like, 
be the man in your life and like step up and it's like a respect thing between the men totally however it is not his job to like inform your dad about everything leading up to that you did this major experiment he shouldn't have been in the dark about that so i thought that that was strange to push all of the responsibility on tim like she's a child like you're a grown woman and you're trying to step into a marriage and i felt like that could have been handled more on the partnership front but tim didn't seem phased by it and when he walks in and there's like her dad her mom her brothers he is just the biggest gentleman he worked that room like it was nothing it was super respectful it was so poised and I'm like, oh, he gets it. It's all about respect. It's all about making everyone feel comfortable. And after all, she's a huge daddy's girl. So like, I think that this was great from the start on his end. Of course, like always, they talk about what made them bond and they discuss that it was family. He touches a little bit on his sisters and the fact that they're not there, but he's just saw so many, you know, similarities. Um, before you know it, he's like, you know what? It's time to eat. He makes everyone a plate. In this conversation, I'm like, oh my God, Tim and Alex's dad are so similar. And that's probably why she like gravitated towards him. Even down to the fact that they were both born in England. Now it's the time where, you know, he asks everyone else to go away for a little bit so he can have one on one time with Alex's dad. And as you guys remember, Alex's dad has MS, so does her mother, but her dad's is very advanced and you can tell because it um, has caused him to kind of like slur his words when he speaks. And he very respectfully, you know, starts this conversation with her dad and he's like, I met Alex do this experiment and I really believe that she's the woman for me moving forward. But from the start, I knew that this conversation between us was important to have. I actually proposed to her with a letter that I intended to read to you. And I would like to do that at this moment. He starts reading this letter, you guys. And seeing her dad, like his reaction throughout, the whole thing broke me. I was sobbing. And I was like, I don't even like Tim and Alex. But this moment just gave me so much respect for Tim because he gets what it means to make your family feel not necessarily like you won't be able to move forward without their approval, but just that respect of like, I value what you think of me. I value what you think of how we move forward. Like, just giving your elders that importance and you could see that that made her dad melt and he was just like like silently sobbing the whole time Tim was reading him this letter and at the end the dad is like listen I just met you but I believe you and you have my blessing I accept you as my son Tim also was very moved he was trying not to like add to it and just give the dad the space to process but it was so sweet everyone came in they exchanged hugs the brothers are also so sweet and they were like brother-in-law we like the sound of that and i was like oh my god am i rooting for tim and alex so the next scene that we see is taylor and garrett going um to taylor's place and it looks like this like cute little brownstone I'm thinking this is going to look Instagram ready. She just looks like a girl that has it all together. They go in. It looks like a messy frat house. There's rooms that have just like junk everywhere. Not nasty, but it's also not like curated. And she just gave me the energy of someone that would be like super meticulous about her space. And it's the complete opposite. She's too busy. She travels so much. It is in disarray. She barely has anything in her fridge. Garrett was just like, okay, this is not what I was expecting. I think that he was also more offended by her fake plant because he likes real stuff. So he's like, mm, we need to change that. But then they sit on the couch and they're, you know, are talking about what it would look like to live together. And she was like, you know, because San Diego, like, that's where I really want to go back to. And he's like, yeah, no, I, I know that I said that I would be down to move to San Diego. And that's still, you know, in consideration. But now that we're doing this, I'm like, mm, that would be really far from my family. And like, as they're making these plans, I would like to be a part of it too. But I also want 
you know, to hold on to us and where it takes us. And she looks a bit offended because in the pods, he seemed like in agreement that he'd be down to go wherever she goes because I think he works remote. And so she's trying to give him grace about that, but you can tell that she's like peeved because as we've heard from Taylor time and time again, like it's all about your actions. You can say pretty things, but are you going to deliver? So she's like trying to keep it together, but she tells him, listen, I understand that living in San Diego, it's far, but we can talk about what that looks like for us. I travel to DC often for work. We can plan to make trips here aside from them being for the holidays. It doesn't have to be a daunting thing if you plan it out. And these two already plan their schedules as is. They can just include family time in that. I think that it is doable. I also feel like they make a good money that it wouldn't hurt them to come back to Virginia as often. So, and what I like about these two, but also makes me like weary on whether or not they're gonna make it to the altar and get married, is that they're honest about their love for each other and honest about the fact that not being together is a possibility because of the big picture things that they want that center around their families. And so while I'm sure it's disappointing to like sense that resistance from him, I also love that they're being super transparent about where they are in their process. The next scene that we see is between Steven and Monica. And you guys, so he lost his job and he knew that this would be a possibility, I guess, from being away doing the experiment for so long. And he says that in the past this has happened and he's only been un unemployed for like a week. And Monica's like, mm, there's no worry, like I know you'll get another job. In the meantime, like I'll be your sugar mama. And as always, Steven takes it too far. He's like, I'll be fine if you take advantage of me. And Monica's like, or not. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you know, like I'd be fine if you just treat me like your boy toy, like your meat. And she's like, mm, well, let's talk about that. Because ever since that conversation we had in Cabo where you had some doubt about how we move forward it's made me hold back apparently they were physically intimate but after that conversation she's like well if I'm not gonna be with this person I'm not gonna continue giving myself to them and Stephen says he understands these things but I really don't think that he listens to what is being said because he'll take something and go off on a complete tangent. He's like, yeah, you know, because us men, like, the wind can blow in a different angle and I'm ready. And she's like, mm-hmm. And he's like, but women, you know, women, there's a combination for each one. And some of them don't even know what their combination is. Again, the mansplaining. And Monica's like, I know my combination. Like, that, that isn't the issue. And it, and there's moments like this where I'm like, does she really like this man? Or does she want to force herself to like him? Because I get secondhand embarrassment from watching them. And I can feel her wanting to crawl into a hole. So I'm just not convinced that she's really into him. And he just continues to babble ridiculousness. And I forget how we got here, but he makes a comment about childbirth being the closest thing to a woman understanding what a man with a cold feels like. And I was like, there is no way that he made a common cold be on the same plane as childbirth. There's just no way that that happened. And Monica's like, are you well? Like, are you okay? No, he is indeed not. But hold on to that thought. We're going to get right back to them. Before we get to them, there's a segment with Hannah. And Hannah's like cleaning furiously around the house. She is using entirely too much paper towel. He comes in because he's been working. And he just comes in to like change shirts and then go back out to work. I think maybe on Zoom. But she's annoyed because he hasn't thrown out the garbage. She had to ask him. And my thing is, I am all here for sharing responsibilities, but this man is on the go making money. You are literally 
not doing anything. And she's going in on him about like having to ask him to take out the garbage for two days and him not like taking initiative with her dog. And again, I understand wanting support, but you have to be a team player. And if he's working, why should he do all of your responsibility? But you have more free time than he does. So what are you doing with your time? I just don't see how this expectation is equitable in any way. She's yapping to yap at this point. And so then this leads them to like a whole conversation about money, which again is important. Um, but it's all about how you have the conversation. And she's just gross in her delivery. And she thinks really high of herself. And again, I'm all for you being proud of your accomplishments and having the hard conversations and being direct. But there's a tinge of nastiness that is unnecessary. And from the start, you know, we know that they have different relationships with money. Um, she says it many times. So she had to be on her own since she was a teenager. He has the privilege of being supported in many ways by her, by his parents. And so they're going, you know, down the line of who will take care of what bill, like if they should do it together, things like that. And so he's still on his family plan for a few things. And he's like, well, if they want to pay for it, like I'll let them pay for it. But I guess what she's hoping to hear is, oh, we're going to take this on together because we are partners. But instead of just saying that, she's like testing him. And if he says the wrong answer, she's like looking at him with disgust. If you have a need, you have to express it. He has not been in many relationships. I don't think he's ever lived with someone. So there are things, expectations that you may have that he hasn't experienced. I'm not saying that you have to like hold his hand through everything, but he cannot read your mind. But yeah, again, it comes down to how you say things. She just had it like with this like attitude like, well, I'm more financially literate than you are. And it's like, girl, you quit your job for a reality show and your personality is ass. If I were you, I would have kept your job. And she's just like, you know, I understand that I want things the way I want it and I need to like work on that as she's not working on it. <laughs> I can empathize with that aspect. I think that when you have been alone for a long time or when you've had to do things for yourself without anyone, it is hard. To, it is hard to like provide the space for someone to come in and to be integrated in that. But also then you probably shouldn't sign up for an experiment that forces you to do this in three weeks, you know? And the next scene that we see is Ashley and Tyler meet up with her dad. Honey, when her dad stepped into the scene, I said, this is Mr. Steal Your Girl. He is the OG. He's looking suave. I can already tell that this is his baby girl. And he's here to just charmingly check Tyler. He sits down and he's like, it's not because she's my daughter, but she is the full package. So he's like, how are you going to protect my daughter? And Tyler's like, well, I'm not a cheater, so I'm going to take care of her. And I want kids with her. And I, I can be my full self with her, be vulnerable. And, you know, all the things that he has already said to us. And we do get a moment where it's just Tyler and her dad. This is the moment that Tyler asks for the dad's blessing. And the dad is like, listen. I know my daughter, she doesn't make decisions lightly, so if she's accepted you, I will accept you. It's confessional, he's like, listen, I'm all with this because my daughter seems sure. The minute I hear uncertainty in her voice, we're going to have some problems. And I love that. And the way that Ashley looks at her dad, I'm like, I can understand why she's the way she is. The episode ends with Monica and Steven and a bomb shell. So when the scene opens up, Monica's on the couch crying and Taylor is beside her. And, you know, he, she's talking about him, Steven, being at a sleep study last night, but they didn't sleep together. And she just like is so confused. And it's really tense. But then it pans to the kitchen and Steven is there. So they're like talking about him and he's just like floating around the space, going to the room. I'm like, what happened? But Taylor exits. Steven eventually makes his way to the couch and they're just like looking at each other. And she's like, 
why would you pretend to want to get married to me? What's finally revealed, you guys, she found some text messages on his phone that were very fetishy and clearly not with her. So he was in the DMs again with someone else. And he's like, there's nothing that I can say for my actions. And she's like, so apparently he was at a sleeping test. I guess he has sleep apnea and he was at a test and he was bored and they had had, I guess, an argument through text. And Monica was like, don't use that against me. Like, that doesn't make this okay. But yeah, he was laid up in the sleep test and started sending some spicy messages to someone else. And I just think it's so crazy because he told her in the pods that he cheated on someone by sending spicy messages to someone in the DMs. And you know what Monica told him? Oh, well, you're being too hard on yourself. You're being too hard on yourself for cheating. Oh, only for him to turn around and do the same thing to her. Like he told her exactly who he was and she was like, no, no, no. But he's been in therapy ever since. He's a changed person. Changed person who repeated the same devious act. And again, he tried to correlate his actions with the fact that they were beefing on text. And Monica was like, no, you don't get to do that. That doesn't make it okay. You were texting some girl while your fiance was sleeping by herself. And he's like, I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. I'm just going to give you your space. And he like walks off for a little bit. And she's like, no, 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 sit back down. Get your phone. It's like, I need you to Venmo me back right now for all of the inconveniences in the last few days. Because remember, he doesn't have a job. So she's been covering everything. And she was covering everything because she's like, you know what? We're a team. You're my future husband. But now you are a cheater that she's gratefully not going to marry anymore. So she was like, uh, run me my coin. I, please do it. And he does it right then and there. And she was like, thanks. And she's obviously heartbroken because they were going to meet her family like in a day. Like this is a blessing that she found all of this out before because he might have been texting with people the minute they got out of the pods. And the thing is, he has been telling us, he has been telling her who he is from the start, especially when he was drunk in Cabo. He mentioned the show a few times which reminded me a lot of just like the Trevor texts. Like Stephen came to the show knowing that he was going to get clout, knowing that he was going to get girls coming his way, knowing that he would get possible opportunities. He just broke that fourth wall a lot. So I think that Monica is thinking about those things in this moment. And she's like, why would you waste this experiment for me? Like, and she's just like, you're so selfish. And like, he ends up walking off. Taylor comes back and Garrett. And they're just consoling her. And I'm glad that she has that support. But it's messed up to think that you're going to get married to someone. And they're making you all these promises. I really do think that a man that plants a seed of love in your heart and can't water it is a coward. That was the end of episode eight. It was explosive and, and episode nine keeps giving. So episode nine starts with Ashley and Tyler and you know, their dog, his dog is in the house. She's like, oh my God, that's like my stepchild. And he's like, well, get ready because we're, we're having seven kids, right? And she's like, no, not seven. And then he's like, oh, okay, well, like three, four. And she's like, well, we'll see. And from the start, Tyler has always talked about wanting kids with Taylor. I think my biggest thing with Tyler is that I love their vibe. I just feel like he he is he's just so sure that it kind of reads like a red flag to me because you guys are just getting to know each other already. You're going to get married and, you know, that's the experiment, whatever. But no one tells you that you have to rush into having kids. So his urgency to start a family is like, mm, I don't know. You see a scene with Hannah and Nick and, you know, they're trying to cook and she's bickering because he wants to help, but he doesn't know what he's doing. But they're preparing. I think it's one of her friends that's coming over. Um, and she's just, again, not being really encouraging. She's just like, yeah, I'm going to let him eat you alive. And it's like, okay, do you like Nick? I, I don't think so. And so her friend is there and like, you know, he's asking them about 
what it's been like living together. And Hannah brings up the conversation about like their cleaning habits. She's like, oh, like, am I too much of a clean freak for you? And he's like, no, like, I don't, I don't mind it at all. I like a clean space. But I'm guessing they had a fight over their dryer. Their dryer takes a long time to set things. So I think he was like on the go and he took clothes out of the dryer and left it on the bed or something. And she was like fighting him about that. And he's like, well, it shouldn't be a problem to you because you're unemployed. And so I'm guessing he's saying that, like, I didn't get to it because I'm on the run, like, getting getting to and from work. And it was definitely a low blow job to throw at her in general, but also to throw at her in front of other people. But I also feel like Nick is probably fed up. And he says it. He's like, she gets to be mean to me all the time, but I can't. And you could tell that she did not like that. And so her response is, you're just mad that I make more money than you. And she talked a little bit about her investments. Um, I'm sure like she probably makes good money from investments and even though she doesn't have a job. But it's just, the, again, what I was saying, her expectations are not actually like equitable. I think she just wants to find things to pick on with Nick because she doesn't like him, but she really wants to stay on camera. She tries to say that like he was being mean and like he can't take a joke or that he takes jokes too far and then walks off to the bathroom. But then her friend and Nick like talk about it and her friend is also like, yeah, she, she doesn't really think about what she says. I've had moments like that too, where she's too mean to me. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the verdict is that Hannah is deeply insecure and that hate that she has for herself comes out of her pores. It's really not fair and she should get some therapy. We see a scene with Garrett and Taylor and Taylor does say that she thinks the way that he stepped up for Monica was super hot. And I agree. I think that in the long run, what you want is someone that will be good to you, but also good to the people that you care about. That was hot. Um, but she wants him around, you know, and she and she like is like, you know, I can't wait for us to go to San Diego. We're going to get to meet my family. And there and, and that way you can, you know, decide if you can picture yourself there. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's it's really a lot to take in and also you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to like take in what your family thinks about this, but I have my family, you know, sharing their thoughts and they have some strong feelings about me marrying someone they barely know and also making this move across the country. And he says that like, he keeps it from her because he doesn't want her to take it personally, but that he has been exchanging emails with his mom and like, she's basically not happy. And again, Taylor is such a mature woman. I don't I don't think that many other people would be handling it in this way. But she tells him, she's like, it is perfectly fine that you and your family are processing this privately. That's so big of her. And I think she's being more empathetic of this because she's in the same boat. Her parents are not really happy about being on camera, specifically her dad. And she tells him, she's like, listen, like, my dad may not want to be on camera, but he still wants to have those conversations with you in private. I still would want you to ask for his blessing in private. And so my feelings about these two is that obviously family is super important. And if they don't get married, it's because they have taken their family's words to heart. So the next scene that we see is of Alex and Tim visiting Tim's place. Um, he owns a home. And I, you know, I wasn't expecting a bachelor pad that looked trifling, but I did expect a lot of order because he just seems very particular. And it's exactly that. I will say that it was pretty cozy for a guy. Um, but everything had its place and everything had significance. So when Alex was like, well, are you open to like change? <laughs> because, you know, we'd be creating a life together. He says yes, but I have a feeling that it's going to take a few talks to convince him because he's so set in his ways. But for the most part, it was a really nice place. I think it's one of the best that we've seen on this show. I would definitely move into a house like that. It, I thought it was really well put together. The next scene we see is of Ramsey's meeting Marissa's mom and her siblings. And Marissa had been, you know, like 
getting him ready for this. He's like, my mom is like, no joke. He's had to be strong because my dad is not in the picture. So just, you know, prepare. Because she hasn't liked any of her exes. So knowing that, I'm like, is, is her mom Boricua? She gave me body vibes. Beautiful lady. Her, her siblings are stunning. But they sit at this table and the mom looks at Marissa and Ramses and is like, y'all are weird. Y'all look alike. And she starts picking apart Ramses's like appearance, saying that it's like outdated and just, it was rude. It was very rude. Like I can't imagine picking apart a stranger's appearance to their face like that. But yeah, they start talking a little bit about Marissa's upbringing and it was rough. Um, and she like, you know, pulls out this like photo album for Marissa. His mom is a straight shooter and she goes straight to asking Ramsey's like what he does for work, his education background, because Marissa wants to be a stay at home mom. And I just thought it was funny that the mom led with that because in the pods, Marissa actually told Ramsey's that she would go crazy being a stay at home mom and that she would be okay with him doing it. And remember, Ramsey's was like, well, I have a remote job, so I, I'm fine with, you know, being the one that's mainly home. Anyway, he tells the mom, he's like, listen, I didn't finish school. I went straight into work, but I have been considering going back to school. And she like presses him a little bit about the degree part. And he tells her that he left school once his dad passed. But he has a good job. And as he's talking about it, she like cuts him off. Marissa's mom cuts him off and is like, I know you're not a bum. I just want to make sure that like she's not going to take care of everything. Again, everything that she says is rough. And I'm all for mama bear. You need to look out for your cub. But this is also a human being that deserves respect. And I totally get him being in the hot seat. But it was just like so uncomfortable, like her body language, she was looking at him like with disgust without a reason. It was a lot. They talk about why they're doing this. He like brings up the fact that he was married before and he's learned about it. And he's just explaining his story because she asked. But as he's explaining, she's like, you're really explaining marriage to me? He wasn't trying to mansplain in that moment. I really don't believe that. Again, it was very hostile. I don't think that there's anything that he would say that would make her like be like, I love him. I think that she went in wanting to hate all men because of her experiences that are valid, but she can't transfer it into her children's relationships. It was a lot. And I think that Ramsey's handled it with a lot of respect. And he just went past her attitude and like answered her questions. Um, but it was a lot. And we hear more about like her, you know, trauma because she's like, listen, I don't believe in marriage. I don't believe in forever. If you guys, you know, love each other or whatever it is that you think you feel like whatever, I just need her to like sign a prenup. <laughs> Ramsey's again is like, yeah, I'm down to sign a prenup. Like I'm not here for her money. And the mom is like, well, she doesn't have any money now, but she will. Cause she's going to be, a, she's going to be a lawyer. She's going to be somebody. And he's like, yeah, totally. And I'm down to sign it. Marissa at this point had been in the bathroom and when she comes back she's like oh like do we have your approval and she's like well are you signing the prenup and marissa's like mom that is my decision and i just saw so much there i can't speak on what the relationship is like but i can definitely feel like the tug of war of like wanting to assert yourself as a person I also get a lot of insight from this as to why Marissa is so happy-go-lucky. Like, she's done that in spite of her upbringing, in spite of who her mom is. <laughs> like, I got so much from that. I would love to know what you guys thought about it, but... So the next scene that we see is of Hannah and Nick meeting up with her parents and her little brother. And it starts off really sweet. You know, he brought gifts for everyone. And Hannah's like, so y'all are not going to grill him? Ew. Like, why would you want your partner to be set up like that? I think that her parents were asking him enough questions. And it was just flowing well. And her mom, I think her mom or her dad was like, well, we sense that you've grilled him enough. 
tell me you know your daughter's a witch without telling me you know your daughter's a witch. And I love that her dad was like, what's the point of me grilling him if you are already engaged? It was just so funny because you can tell her parents have gone through it with her attitude. Um, but she, you know, is like, I recognize that like I tend to nitpick him a lot. And they say basically what I said, like marriage is long, many things will come up and you have to pick your battles. And it's just the way that she does it. It's very shameful. And I just think that you can really tear someone's spirit with that kind of carelessness and it shouldn't be taken lightly, you know? And I love that her parents know her deeply and her mom is looking at her and she's like, why are you so uptight? Like, why are you, like, relax? Happy that someone that knows her gets to call her out on that because I think that, Nick is not perfect, but he has been super accommodating and he has been pushing through all of the dirt that she throws at him. So I just feel like she needs to count her blessings and if she doesn't like him, just leave. But he's been super accommodating to her horrid personality. Um, and he had been away getting gifts for her sibling. And so there's a moment where Nick goes back to the car to get like a gift for her brother. And she has a moment with her parents and she's like, yeah, I like him. And they're like, yeah, no, we like him too. And she's like, there's some personality things that, you know, we have to work through. And they're like, yeah, if it came to that, we would have thrown you out. Like, you don't throw people out because they have a few flaws. So what I'm hearing is that Hannah is throwing stones from a glass house. Next scene is Alex and Tim. They go to Alex's place. You guys, it's like a cyclone hit this place. She says that this mess is from her packing up to go to the pods. Lies. The mess here is at hoarder level. I'm honestly surprised at how chill he was about it. He's like, no judgment. Like, it was just still cute and light. And I'm shocked. I honestly thought that he was going to flip out. After that, we see Taylor bring Garrett to meet her friends. And it's super sweet. They're all like, wow. Our girl is in love. We've never seen her be this light. Look at someone with the hard eyes. And it was just overall really sweet. The next scene we see uh, is between Ramses and Marissa. And any respect that I had for Ramses left my body in this scene. So they debrief a little bit about the lunch with her mom and she's like yeah my mom needs therapy i know <laughs> he tells her again he's like listen i'm down for a prenup and she gets to talking about like a timeline for kids like what they're thinking he says he would like kids in like three to four years and she's like mm, i would like it in two and he's like no like i want us to be able to enjoy our time together and she's like okay well if you want to wait then I, I really need to go talk to my doctor about birth control but I really don't want to. And he's like, well, if it's going to affect your health, like I totally understand you not doing it. Um, but then we just have condoms. And she's like, yeah, condoms. I think condoms may be the way. And he's like, yeah, but condoms aren't pleasurable. And I, I, you know, sex should be pleasurable. And I agree that it should be pleasurable. But you just said you don't want kids. And if you don't want kids, then you can't Right. And I'm so turned off by this combo because it almost made it seem like she has no choice. Like the responsibility to prevent this is on her. And it was just really, it really put a bad taste in my mouth. Like I did not, it just undid everything that he did for his image. Like this guy that's like so woke and so like politically aware and emotionally intelligent but also is a misogynist and has no respect. It was just like, wow, like you painted yourself to be this open-minded guy only to come up with this. And it's clear like they are at odds over this. Um, the second to last scene that we see is with Nick and Hannah going to meet his parents. Um, and she comes in with so many gifts. It was super thoughtful. I guess she really asked him like details about her about his parents and she brought gifts specifically tailored to their interests. It was so sweet and intentional. His parents seemed really sweet. Um, his mom was making ropa vieja. So I was like, wait, is Nick Cuban? We see a moment with him and his dad and he, you know, says that he likes Hannah thus far and he's just like, listen, 
I learned a lot when I was with your mom, and I have a feeling that you're going to have a lot of learning to do too. Nick agrees. We see Hannah with his mom. He tells her the reasons why she picked Nick, but also admits that she's been a bit critical. He kind of resents the fact that she had to grow up much quicker than he has. And the mom is like, yeah, I probably coddled our kids, but I think that in the long run, they're going to want to raise their kids the same way because our kids always had us present. They never needed anything. So like, I don't regret that we did it that way. But sure, he, he's going to have some learning to do. I love that the mom like, you know, recognized that she did pamper her kids and that they did have a lot of family time and that they did prioritize sports over like chores but he's open to change and she mentions that he grew up with strong women around him so like he can handle it and i think that he has shown that like he likes that too overall the parents are like smitten by hannah and they joke like if these two don't get engaged like they still want to keep her it's very sweet the last scene of this episode you guys I had seen some bits of it on social media and I was trying to stay away because I was like, there's no way. There is no way. So the scene opens in Ashley and Tyler's apartment. Ashley is dressed on the couch. Tyler has his hoodie over his head and the vibe is not what it's been. In this scene, she is crying and he looks very guilty. So she's just like, you had so many opportunities to tell me in the pods in mexico you could have told me this information before you proposed so that i can make an informed decision and if you haven't watched you're like what did he hold back from her you guys this man has children plural the whole time he's like yeah i want to have kids but he already has them. So it makes me rethink every single thing that he has said. Remember when he said that he wanted seven kids and that he was like, oh, I'll settle for four? Of course he'll settle for four because he has three kids. So if she just adds four more, then he has the seven that he said he wanted. And so given what they say in this scene, it sounds like he tells her that he doesn't have a relationship with them, that he was just like a donor. And so she's like, I wish that I would have been given all this information. Like, I need to see proof that this was just a donation and that you don't have any involvement. And she's just like, how am I supposed to believe you if you kept this from me for so long? And they're supposed to get married in two weeks. So it is pretty crappy, like to find this out in this way. I'm still not sure if she like found out or if he was just like, I can't keep this in any longer. But he's just like, you know, like, I really want this to work. I really love you. Like, I'll get you whatever documentation you need. Like, I really want us to get married, but I'll respect your decision. It's so wild because they have been, like, the strongest couple thus far. Um, and to unravel because of deceit must be so painful for Ashley. And you could see that she's a bit rattled by this. And she loves him and she like said that like you know it was us against the world but she's a smart girl so I I can see like her brain move, like working overtime to try to make sense of this now as for Tyler he says that he was a donor he also said that he wanted to start Christmas traditions with her because he spent last Christmas by himself well the lie detector determined that that was a lie. Spoiler alert, you guys. I don't know if they ended up getting married or anything, but allegedly his mother-in-law came out on social media and was like, wow, like he left my daughter and then he went on this show and pretended like his kids didn't exist. He was not a donor, according to this person. He was very much in their lives until like a few months before he got on the show. And that notion of him being alone on Christmas, yeah, there's pictures of him in matching pajamas with one of his kids. It's so disheartening when people disappoint you like this. It's crazy. I can't wait for the details to unravel because also saying that your kids were like a sperm donation when you were with their mother and like, I hope his kids never see this clip. That's trifling. And that was the end of the episode. I guess we'll find out more on that. But so next week we're gonna get 
the finale episode and then we get the wedding episode and then the week after that they have already announced a reunion and of course they had Leo and Brittany announce the reunion it's gonna be a mess and I've seen already that like Monica has done some like interviews on the side with the vile files and more of them are you know are doing more press I foresee this finale and this reunion being nasty I would love to know your thoughts I've been yapping for a long time. Thank you so much for making it to the end. And I will see you guys in the next one.